I belong to a family of very enlightened people. My father was a linguist and he was master of fourteen languages. He knew about twenty-six languages and he translated even Qur'an and Sharif into Hindi language. My mother <coughs> was, in those days, was a honours in mathematics. So both were very well educated and enlightened people. At the time of my birth, my mother dreamt something which she could not explain, but after that she had a great desire to go and see a tiger in the open field. My father was a great hunter because tigers were a menace in the area where we were living. It was a hill station called Chindwara. So there was a king who was very much interested in my father. Somehow or other a letter came that there is a tiger, very big tiger that has appeared and they are frightened of him that he might be a man-eater. So my father took my mother and me to that place and they were sitting what we call as a machan where they built something for people to sit on top of a tree from where they can shoot nicely. And then my mother tells me that a big, huge tiger of a very big size very beautifully appeared on the field and she felt tremendous love for the tiger. It was a full moon day and she felt extremely compassionate towards the tiger. And when my father raised his gun to shoot, she stopped him and she wouldn't allow him. Then the tiger went away and he never came to that forest again. But that made my father think, because he himself was a realized soul, that must be somebody, ka, what we call a Goddess Durga, who is fond of a tiger, must be born to my mother because the symptoms were rather funny that a lady should like to see a tiger. You know. So he told my mother, now are you satisfied because they were struggling with the gun. He said, is there a Durga sitting in your womb that you are trying to protect the tiger? She said, yes, yes, so stop it now, I won't allow you. Like that there were many incidents in my life because I am of a Christian family, Protestants, and uh, when I was born my mother didn't feel any labour pains or anything and just I was born, she didn't know how and <clears throat> I had no blood on my body, nothing, I was clean washed, that's why they called my name as Nirmala. But my grandmother said that she should be called as Nishkalanka, that means the one which has no spots on it, but that's the name of a man. So they said, all right, we'll call her Nirmala, meaning the same Immaculata. Now all these incidents and then my father being a realized soul, he felt tremendous vibrations from me and he felt that this life is great and she will do something great in this life. I do not know why but I don't know if he dreamt or he understood it but all the time if I remember when he talked to me he used to say that you have to find out a way of giving a mass realization all the time. As I told you he was a great scholar of so many things and a very widely read man. So he gave me <coughs> a good education in religion, in different religions and also good education about human beings. What are their problems? Why did he act like this? Why don't they take to God? Why are they hypocritical? All kinds of things he talked to me. <coughs> he also knew about Kundalini but not so much. Of course, when I was born, I knew about Kundalini myself. I knew all about it from my very childhood. 
I was a very aware person, extremely aware. But I didn't know how whom to talk to because, you see, people didn't have that awareness. You can't talk to everyone like that. So I was regarded as a very jolly person at the same time, very serious also, very deep. And then I started my studies as a child. I was not very much interested in the studies, but I used to do very well. But I used to read lives of great men and things like that. At a very young age, I read Bernard Shaw. When people were reading just read expectations, I was reading Bernard Shaw. But as such, I didn't have interest in particularly reading some textbooks because I thought they were childish and uh, there's nothing to be read about it. Then I told my father that I have to do medicine. So he said, why? I said, because I have to talk to doctors. He said, you have to talk to doctors. Yes, I said. But <coughs> it so happened in my childhood when I was about seven years of age. My father was a congressman. He had joined Congress when I was four years of age. He used to live with a style, very westernized, his clothes were stitched in London, sort of a man. We had governesses and all that. He threw away everything and he became a real Indian and started leading a life of a martyr. Then he made us study our languages, Sanskrit. He made me study in an Indian school, not in a missionary school, because missionaries were very unkind. They threw us out of the school when my father was in the Congress. They were against us completely. Then at the age of seven years, I happened to go with my father to Mahatma Gandhi. He was about seventy miles living with us, but the first time he took me down and Mahatma Gandhi liked me very much, he said, leave this child with me. So I had not even taken clothes or anything, I stayed on. Then my father sent me everything <coughs> with him. And he was very fond of me, but I was a little girl. But he understood that there was something about me. He consulted me on very serious problems sometimes, surprisingly. Like one day he wanted to make the prayer book all right. So he asked me, how should I put the series and all that. So I told me how to put the series and he put the series in that way. I used to go back for my school and again go back to Gandhiji every year like that. And he called me Nepali, he gave me a name Nepali. Everybody used to call me Nepali that time. Then I grew up with him very intimately. He was a very, very kind person for children, otherwise an extremely strict man, with himself and with others, very strict, a big disciplinarian. And he would make everybody get up at four o'clock, have your baths, everything, be ready for your uh, morning prayers at five o'clock, you see, and he used to walk very fast. I also learned walking fast with him in his company, I had to walk fast. And very extremely loving and a very nice person. And he would listen to me because I was a child, you see, supposing I forced him to eat more or something, then he wouldn't laugh, he would accept. Very kindly person. But with others he was very strict and I used to tell him that, why are you strict with everyone? Uh, he said, but you are a little girl, you get up in the morning time, why can't they get up? I said, I'm little, that's why I get up. They are big so they can't get up. Like that, you see, little chats. <coughs> And uh, then my father went to jail and my mother also went to jail five times. My father went to jail twice, once for about two and a half years and he was the only supporting member of the family. By the way, we come from a very old royal family uh, which is called as Shalivahanas. They have a calendar also in India. And then when we, we I mean, when they took my father to jail, we had to leave our house and we had to live in hearts and in all problems, that was nothing. But also me, they pestered a lot because I helped many people there and I joined the 42 movement in a very serious way and I became the leader here for the young people. I thought, unless and until I take a very positive stand, it may not work out with them. It's not gracious to say how they tortured me, what they did to me, 
but they really tortured me. I was a young girl of 19 years that time. It's over now, so it's finished. And <clears throat> after that, we, uh, my father went to jail again, and then when he came back, he got elected as the member of the Central Assembly later on as the Constituent Assembly and then of the Parliament. My brother was also a member of the Parliament later on. Now recently he was the uh, minister in the Cabinet. Another brother is a High Court judge in Bombay. They are all doing well despite the fact that our parents neglected us in a way because they gave their lives to the country, but you see that never deterred us from studies and we came up very well. Then I, when I was in 42 movement to see my college rusticated me from the college, they threw me out and I had to go to another college to study far away from my house in Punjab, where I studied for <coughs> two years, science I did, then I did my medical. I didn't do fully because just after that the 47 riots broke out. So the college was closed and I didn't want to know more because what I wanted to know, I came to know about it. So I did not need and I got married. You must have heard my husband was, is now the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization. He held very high positions. He was also Secretary to Lal Bahadur Shastri, who was our Prime Minister, who was another very great man, but he did not survive long. If he had survived, things would have been different, I think, for our country because he was a Gandhian, out and out Gandhian, and he lived like an ideal Gandhian personality. So that's how the life went on. But inner being was still seeking the way and methods of giving our mass realization. My father said, before you do not develop this technique of giving our mass realization, don't talk of religion. Let nobody know that you know anything about it because they'll crucify you or he was rather worried that people won't understand, or you may write another Bible or Gita, no use. First of all, you must give them realization. If they get their realization, then they will realize that there's something about it, above this human awareness. For example, he always used to give an analogy. Supposing you are born on the tenth story and everybody is on the ground, you must at least make them climb two stories so they know there's something above it. Otherwise, no use talking about it. And he said, this is the mistake uh, between the saints and the incarnations was that they never realized that these people are still on the ground. They have to still enter into the building. So that is what you have to be very careful that, first of all, you must give realization to people. So I was seeking the ways and methods, working it out inside myself through my own style of meditation in the sense that I would work out all the permutations and combinations. Supposing I met one person, then I would see what problems that person had, how you can overcome it like that. I would try to study that person internally. And I went to many people to find out, but I found they were great hypocrites. I saw so many of these gurus, most of them I saw them, I was sur surprised they were all hypocrites, money-making and this thing. And also I went to Rajneesh also to see him. Then he said that I should come to his program. I didn't know what sort of a man, because he was talking about Gita and big, big things, I thought he might be knowing something about it. I went there, but my husband said, no, I won't allow you to go to his camp. So he arranged his own bungalow and all that for me, so I went down there. And there I couldn't see all the things that were going on. And that is the day, somehow or other, I said, I must open the last chakra. So the last chakra was open. And I saw the <coughs> Kundalini, which is the primordial force within us, which is the Holy Ghost within us, rising, like a telescope opening out. And then I saw the whole thing open and a big torrential rain of grace. 
started flowing through my head all over, as if, and I felt I'm lost now, I'm no more there, it's only the place is there, the, that is there. I saw it completely happening to me. And, uh, but I was amazed that uh, when I went to Rajneesh, you see, because before going I had to say goodbye, he never realized what had happened or anything, you see. So I was surprised, I said, this man doesn't know anything about God. And then I discovered that they were all hypocrites and telling lies. So in 1973, this happened on the 5th of May, uh, 70, 1975th of May. And just after that, I, we had a very big lecture in Jahangir Hall, there's a very big hall, and thousands of people had come. I told them very frankly that these are all thugs and these are like these hypocrites, some of them are demonic, some are evil people, I took their names, everything, I told them, don't go near them. They were some foreigners also. And uh, there were so many others whom I told these things very clearly. And they got frightened, they said, you shouldn't say like this, they will come and murder you, they will do. I said, let them come and murder me. But nobody did anything, nobody even went to the courts. And that's how, you see, uh, they tried to bring bad name to me, they paid money to the newspapers to publish things against me because I said, you cannot pay money. So they thought that I was just trying to, you see, uh, harm them by saying such a thing that you can't earn money in the name of God. If it's a job, you can do it, but God's work is not a job. And the struggle started from the day I started giving realization. And I started with one lady who got realization first, then we got about twelve people who got realization. In two years I got only about fourteen people realization. Then gradually when fourteen people got realization, then many others started getting realization. But I started also curing people because that was helping a lot. Then uh, my, hu my husband got elected to this post and we had to come to London. So when I came to London, we had one program in Bharti Vidya Bhavan, they arranged it. So the Indians abroad are not so much interested in God, <laughs> they are more interested in money. So none of the Indians stayed there, they all ran away. And uh, only the foreigners who were there were about seven hippies. So I had to work on them, seven hippies, for four years I was working on them <laughs> to give them realization. Very difficult, you see. Their liver was bad, they had ill health, their head was off, <laughs> terrible times. But in between I used to go to India, and in India also the work was done. For three months always I would be in India. So we started work in the villages, especially, surprisingly, where my forefathers were ruling in that area, the work started moving in a very big way. And there then we started taking some people from India. Then some people came from Australia to India, like that, and the work started moving in those directions. Then gradually the work improved and people found that this is the way we can transform ourselves. Many people were taking drugs or alcoholic or mad people or cancer people, they felt better, then they got cured, and it was established that Sahaja Yoga is something very important. Now, when I travel all over the world, you see, first time my husband used to pay for everything, wherever I went, he had to pay or any expenses he used to do for me. Gradually, then now these people pay for my travel, but otherwise they don't have to pay for anything else. That's how we started our work. Uh, there was a lot of opposition and the media people would never understand it because it was no such a sensation, as you can say, uh, nothing to people feel excited. But in a way it's a very great thing because if this is the solution for the whole world, one should try to do it. Then we had very great people who came sah to come, came to Sahaja Yoga, like we can say the Hague High Court judge, who is now the president, who has given Nicaragua uh, thing, judgment. He and many uh, lawyers and many barristers, we have one barrister here from Algeria, 
and doctors, and then they took over and they started helping me out how to propagate Sahaja Yoga. But it was a difficult task in the West. Of course, in India it spread very fast in the villages, but city people in India also are westernized and they start analyzing. They don't know much about our past, they don't know uh, anything about our heritage that we have, our Kundalini and all that. But some people do know about self-realization. But these gurus could not stick on in India because nobody would accept them, so they all run away abroad. And that was something, a blessing for me also, because I didn't have to fight them <laughs> uh, And it started working out and then people found that it helps in every way and they found so many miracles about it. And that's how Sahaja Yoga got settled quite a lot. But still, I would say that we have not been to certain countries so far. And in the West, I would say that so much work has still to be done. As soon as you start and you work in any place, first of all, they want me to cure people and to help them with curative. Now, if I pay attention more to that, then uh, the main work is to create doctors out of everyone that is neglected. Then you become unpopular. They think, oh, she's not sympathetic and this and that. But now, as we have, everybody can cure now, everyone. I don't cure anyone directly. But they don't like it, they want I should be there and then you ought to be pampered and all those things are there. Rather difficult. It's not, we are not running an election, you see, like we should please other sort of thing, it's not there. But whatever is reality, uh, if a person has intelligence, pure intelligence, he can see that this is something very different. And for that one has to uh, understand that you cannot uh, you cannot force on anyone that you get your Realization in the same way. You cannot force Me that I give you Realization, because if it does not work, it does not work. It's such a living force, you see, and uh, that upsets them very soon. I feel that the way this Industrial Revolution has come in the West, people have lost their moodings, perhaps they're so confused with all these gurus coming down here, confusing them <laughs> and all kinds of new things coming, they don't know where to look. But unless and until get, you get your evolution completed, unless and until you reach that absolute state of understanding, the chaos will remain. So one has to try to get to that. But one must understand you can't pay for it, there's no effort. There's another great thing has happened in Delhi University that the Delhi University has accepted that a person can do, only a doctor can do a PhD or we can say the doctorate in Sahaja Yoga and he gets the highest uh, degree called the Doctor of Medicine. And a, perhaps maybe after some time they will allow anyone to do that. This is about the medicine part of it. In agriculture, we have done lots of research by myself. You have somebody here, an expert on agriculture. He's also done a lot of research. And we found out that with vibrations, we start after realization. If you vibrate the water and if you water the plants with that, then sometimes you might get even ten times more breed. That's what they did in India in one of the agricultural universities, but here also he's found out that there's tremendous difference between the growth of an ordinary thing. Another thing we have found out in agriculture, that if you get vibrations, then even an ordinary cow can give a lot of milk. But if you have hybrid cows, then you see that it's not good for the brain because a person who takes hybrid milk also gets hybrid and his brain becomes a little wobbly. So better to have a pure milk from a cow which is not being uh, put to this kind of a experimentation. Moreover, food also, if it's hybrid food, is not very good for us because that spoils our nerves, I think. But ordinary seeds you cannot use because they have weakened and they cannot reproduce. 
So when we vibrate them, they produce very well, just like better than even sometimes hybrid things, and the food it tastes very well and it doesn't give those complications. So this can help in agriculture in India and the government has allotted us a lot of land where we are going to now experiment and we are going to start the experimentation there to show that how we can use this. But many farmers who are Sahajogis have done a lot of job and they have uh, discovered that even animals and uh, this, uh, what you call, farming, everything is helped very much by vibration. What do you think are the important points in the education of children? What are important to give to the children? You see, first, if they, if they get realization, to get first them to that point of realization, if they are already born realized, no problem, but if they, have, they are given realization, then, you see, they start seeing from a different level, they become the spirit. So their self-respect, you see, awakened. <coughs> Such children behave in a very dignified, elderly manner, you see, they talk in a very elderly manner and they give solutions of all kinds, you see. And they are tremendous people, but we have to guide them properly by our own behavior how we behave. The greatest thing is how we behave, that's how the children learn. We put the children uh, certain to some tests, how they are, we find out if they have any physical problems, we cure them, if they have mental problem, we cure them, if they have any other problem, social problem or anything, we try to help them out. So that basically if a human being is all right in his childhood, then fundamentals are all right for the child, the foundation is laid down. Then to build that child up into a good quality is not difficult. So now we find great artists are there, they are great musicians and at a very young age they have started playing violin. I mean suddenly they have become dynamic also and very humble. They are very humble and self-respecting and very well behaved. It's surprising how the atmosphere is and how it works out. And the other day the lady asked me about the women and I told her that a woman's power as a mother is very great. She felt hurt about it, but I didn't mean that you should be just a mother. What I'm saying, she is a mother, means she is compassionate, she is kind, she is not aggressive like man. That is a very big quality, that's a very big power in a woman. That's what I was suggesting, that that is what we have to harness, not to compete with men, it's madness. We have to understand that life has to be uh, enjoyable, life should be a blessing, not to be a misery. We create our own miseries by these false ideas, by our own uh, con convictions we have in our mind, mental projections we have in our mind, or our own obstinacy, whatever it is. All these things can be cured if uh, you take to Sahaja Yoga, because you become a balanced person, level-headed, wise person, and you become a witness. The whole thing becomes like a show, like a drama, and you become fearless, you start seeing the whole thing like a drama. And this is what a human being has to achieve. We talk of peace, we talk of uh, uh, no war, we talk of many things like this, you see, atomic bomb, this, that, all that is not going to work out. Only what is going to work out is the transformation of human beings. If the human beings are transformed, things will work out absolutely first class. Not only that, but that they will enjoy the bliss of life. We are missing the point altogether. This is a very important thing uh, that human beings must say one thing. What have we achieved out of all this? Just for a minute to stop and think. Or illnesses are caused by the imbalances within us, by our extreme behavior. And supposing, say now, the cancer, we can take the cancer. Cancer is caused by the overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Now supposing uh, a person is uh, a very 
sad person. He cries and weeps and all the time feels guilty and thinks that he is the worst person ever born, he's committed so many sins and all sorts of nonsense, you see. Then he goes to the left side, according to us, and crosses over to the collective subconscious area. And there, according to us, what they call as protein 58 and uh, protein 52, doctors call it that way, but we call it as the dead souls. They exist there and they catch hold of you and they trigger the cancer. But supposing by any chance you can bring the attention fully away from that, in the center, you can get cured. So it is the centers within us which are subtle, which are basically seven centers. There are many others, but basically seven. If you can put them right, you cannot have any sickness or illness of any kind. Gandhiji was a tremendous man, one has to learn a lot from him. He was not at all a hypocrite, that's one thing. Uh, and he was not like modern, we say, say, politicians who say something, do something, no. He was very outspoken and always he put himself on the testing point. And uh, he used to confess if he made mistakes immediately. One very great incident I remember when I was a small child, they were having a uh, meeting together and we girls were there only sitting, giving them uh, water and things to all the people, all the big uh, people were there like Jawaharlal Nehru was there and also Mola Nazad, all these people were sitting there. <coughs> they were discussing something and uh, then suddenly Mahatma Ji said that now it's very late, we'll have lunch here. So they said, yes, yes, we'll have lunch here. They had to go to the guest house, which was far away. So Atmaji asked for the ba, his, his wife, she had gone out. So he got up, he had a key with him, you see, always of the storeroom. He opened the storeroom. And he asked the people who are, were in charge of cooking to measure everything according to the people there are properly, everything, you see. And then he, when they measured it out, everything was done, then he put the key back and then he went and sat there nicely. So these people said, Papu, we did not know you have to take so much trouble, you see, to go all the way and major out everything for us. It didn't take much time, about fifteen minutes, but still. So he said, what do you think? This is the blood of my country, I cannot allow it to be wasted. See, that's the sign of a person who understands the value of public money, that's just ingrained in him. But those who saw him also felt that, look at this man who is living like a ascetic absolutely in the sense that he would not touch the public money. And that is one of the key keys for all the leaders. If they are absolutely above the money, then only people will respect, otherwise there is no way out. But if you find these days in every country so much of corruption, hypocrisy, then you are really shocked.